have to pass <laughs> to each other. They have to all be on the floor. Like that game that they played, that there's a basket, there's an orange ball. Ben Simmons hasn't played that game in 14 months. Does he want to shoot free throws? Does he want to drive to the rim? What role is he going to have on this team? Who is going to be on this team around those big three? To me, if you want to argue the Nets are the second best odds to win the East, that's fine. That's cool. Like, I don't really necessarily disagree with you. Me, personally, they're off my board. I just got to see it first. The Nets have had Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving play 58 combined games their first three years with the Nets. Let's see them play 58 games together this season. Yeah, then, then maybe make any then maybe I'll say they're the second favorite in the East. But yeah. let's see that first. And by the way, those odds you put them up, the Heat are fifth. I mean, when will they ever get any respect? Well, and to Zach's point, the other four teams on that board all were in the second round of the playoffs. Yeah. The Nets got demolished by the Celtics in the first round in a sweep. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Right. So, Seth, what do you think about these Nets living up to the pressure? I mean, right now, Zach talking about, There's yeah, no in pressure. Stratomatic, they look good. But at this point, on the, on the court. It, to me, the, it, it has nothing to do with pressure. It has to do with basically being healthy and having those guys play together like, you know, obviously Zach and Tim just said. If you can get those guys to play together, I think they need one more perimeter defender and some type of rim protection to complement those guys. It's not just Joe Harris and Seth Curry, but I do think that there's potential, you know, and, and here's the deal. Potential, will it be realized? That is the question for the Nets. Do they have the potential with those three guys if they're healthy and if they're playing at, in, a, in a matter in which they're able, capable to play? We could say Ben Simmons didn't take a layup. We could say he can't make a free throw. But I'll tell you what, we could also say he's an elite defensive player. A defensive rebound is an opportunity to get in transition. We could also say that he could be a short roller and a terrific passer. And we could also say he can advance past to Kyrie and Kyrie can then transition make a play. So there are things he can do it's basically, will he be on the floor to do it? And what are the things, his weaknesses, can he get it to the point where they're functional? If they can, the Nets are going to be a dangerous team, but they've got to be on the court together. So it's not pressure. It's about, you know, developing a chemistry, developing a trust, and then developing a standard and an expectation and being held to that each and every day because they haven't been together. Championship teams have a standard. They have a culture. They have an identity. We don't know what the Nets' identity is because we haven't seen this group together. Yeah, spoken like a true coach. Culture, <laughs> identity, accountability. But real quick, put a button on it because I wonder how the relationship now is with KD and Kyrie. Kyrie brought KD there. Kyrie looking to go elsewhere. Now he's back. Will that work out? Kyrie was looking to get a max extension from the yeah. Nets. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say he was necessarily looking to leave, right? So now he's on the Nets. I think things are. I think things with them are fine. Okay, okay. He's back. Let's see how they perform. That's the big if. Great job on basketball, guys, today. Honestly, outstanding. And look at more basketball coming up. Big game coming up in the WNBA. And this one tonight, 7 Eastern, the Mystics, the Dream. And also on ESPN2, you see right there, that's coming up tonight. Also coming up, one of the NFL's all-time great runners back, ready to make an impact, just not in the way you expect. We'll talk about that in just a few. But first, a little sneaky Hembo time. This one for Dan Graziano, Hembo's biggest nemesis. Adrian Peterson has the most career rushing yards among active players. Who ranks second? Seems like an easy question. I'm just not sure. See if Dan can get it when we come back. You guys a team, and you'll tell me what their wish should be for the upcoming season. So, Seth, the Nets, what should their wish be? Their big three play 60 games together so they can get ready for the playoffs to make a run. If they don't get 60 games together, they don't develop the chemistry you need. If they can get those three guys on the court for 60 games together, then the Nets have a chance to make a run. Wow, remember when there was a time where NBA stars played 82 games? Oh, how about that? <laughs> Tim, the Warriors, what should their wish list be? Well, speaking of guys who haven't played, James Wiseman basically has not played in three years, right? Barely played at Memphis, basically hasn't played his first two years in the NBA. Let's see what James Wiseman can do this year for the Golden State Warriors. I think if they can get him on the court, see what he looks like, that to me is the number one thing for them this offseason. That would be great. Wiseman, Kaminga, Moody. I mean, this A lot of exciting young talent, but let's see it get on the court. Yeah, he's got to get on the court. Okay, Zach, the Lakers, what should their wish be? Taylor Horton Tucker has worked all summer on his three-point shot, and it looks good. Kendrick Nunn is healthy and is the player they thought he was going to be when they re-signed him. Look, anyone can sit here and tell you, we all know the Lakers aren't going anywhere if Anthony Davis isn't Anthony Davis again. If that happens, and I'm optimistic it, it will, the only way they're getting where they really want to go is if the role players around them fit. So start there. 
All right, so we're talking about the Lakers, and when you think about it, let's stop down here. We're talking about Taylor Horton Tucker and none coming through. And that just stuns me considering that these Lakers were in a position a couple days ago where they thought they might get Kyrie. So now that Kyrie is not an option, Seth, where do LeBron and the Lakers go from here? They need athleticism and shot making. I mean, wherever they can find it. It comes down to now evaluating up. When you're in this situation, it's not where a guy is. You've got to find fit guys that are athletic enough that can make shots, that can open up the floor so LeBron can do his thing, KD can do his thing. To me, that's the whole thing. Can they find a guy on the fringe? You know, they don't have the money, so they've got to evaluate up, and they can't do it with old hats. they got to do it with the younger, more athletic bodies that can make shots, that can play 80 games. All of that is accurate. The mm -hmm. problem for the Lakers is they don't have the ability to do it, right? They can only sign one guy with the taxpayer's mid-level exception. It's a few million dollars. They might not be able to even bring back Malik Monk, who was probably their brightest spot last year as a guy they found, right? So, yeah, they've got Austin Reeves, who was a nice find. Maybe they can unearth another project like him that's an undrafted rookie that can do some stuff for them. But they just don't have the flexibility to add all the pieces around them to get where they need to go. To Zach's point, if Anthony Davis is healthy, LeBron James is there, they can be a very good team. But to be a championship-level team, this team just needs too much around them that they just don't have a way to get. Wow, so, Zach, if they're not a championship-level team, where does that leave LeBron in this team long-term? Because I can't imagine that he's going to want to sit around for the next two or three years playing on a team that barely makes it into the playoffs. Well, LeBron is going to tell us a lot about that because he could sign an extension starting in August. And if he does, that's great. If he doesn't, are the Lakers on the clock? We'll see. Everything I've been told is that LeBron would like to remain with the Lakers. Anthony Davis is still there. At some point, Russ's deal comes off the books. You can start retooling the roster around him so that it looks more like the roster that won the championship in 2020. And then they voluntarily dismantled it for reasons that are still unclear and baffling to me. But yeah, I mean, look, the West is loaded. It is what it is. And we always talk about the Lakers because they're the Lakers. Other than this Kyrie wild card, they just, it's th th this idea that they can sort of magic up a third star or whatever is just not plausible and it's going to be like last year when it's Avery Bradley, Wayne Ellington, Ken Bazemore, Malik Monk. We'll see who hits. I mean, that's their reality. And that's why they were the one team that was willing to do a sign and trade with the Nats for Kyrie Irving, as Adrian reported, right? Because they were the one team that was in a desperate enough situation that they had to do it. That, that, was the only, that was why they were the one team that won. I think that's what gets me. The, the fact that they're on a desperation plane at this point, when now all the rest of the NBA can see. So it's not as if they're going to, like, hoodwink some franchise right. and get somebody great. So is there any path forward for these Lakers, as you realistically see it, for them to be at least even a top four team? The path forward is, as Zach said, to wait. They have to get through this season with Russell Westbrook on the team. Okay, so they wait can maybe he's gone. Or, well, or turn him into something maybe at the deadline if something comes available. But they need something like this Kyrie Irving situation to come to fruition, right? Mm -hmm. Something that comes aboard out of nowhere where they can use that Russell Westbrook expiring contract to upgrade the roster. Yeah. Otherwise, they have to wait till he comes off the books and maybe LeBron James doesn't extend, gets a free to see, you know, if they can maneuver the salary cap then. But there's not a quick fix. There's not something you can look at and say today and say, here's how the Lakers could get from a borderline play-in team. Maybe they get into the top six to being a top four team, short of something like, you know, Kyrie Irving falling out of the sky and landing on their team, which there's just not another option like that, which again is why, as Adrian reported, they were the one team that was willing to do this because they didn't have much to trade and they had no reason not to take the risk. Wow. They have so two of the top ten Good. players in the NBA, though. I mean, like, potentially they have two of the top ten players in the NBA. If Russell Westbrook can find some niche role and buy into it and they find a piece or two around, like, it's not the nine. Is LeBron James one of the top ten players in the NBA? Is if he's Anthony healthy. Davis, yeah, is Anthony Davis, if he's healthy, obviously if he's healthy, sure. is he one of the top ten players in the NBA? They're both, so you've got I would two say pieces there, that, yeah. can, that, can, that can lead you to a championship. Can Russell Westbrook be productive? Who knows? I mean, you, know, you guys have strong opinions on it. That's Darvin Ham's job is to get to him to buy into a role, all right, and embrace that role and champion a role that adds to winning. And then, like you guys said, you guys know better in terms of the money but can you find one or two pieces that complement him? They did it with Caruso. They did it with that team that won a championship. Can they do that? It's possible if those two guys stay healthy and Russ buys into a role and champions a role that's not maybe the role he wants.
That graphic that just showed on the screen there with Dwight Howard, Carmelo, and Avery Bradley as, young, as the notable unrestricted free agents <laughs> on the roster, that That's sums fine. up where the Lakers are at because they have to go shopping in the bargain bin to sign guys on minimum contracts to fill out this roster for eight, nine, ten spots. It's just very hard to win when two-thirds of your team is on minimum contract. Yeah, we saw we that learned, last year with the Lakers. And we learned last year, the, uh, signing a bunch of guys who are 30 years and older, not going to work. We're going to see who they're going to try to find this year. And that's the West and the Lakers. Let's go to the East. And I just find this so interesting. The odds to win the Eastern Conference with Kyrie back, their odds, the Nets, drop from plus 380 to plus 320, tied with Milwaukee for second best. Only short of the Celtics. Their odds to win in the entire championship have dropped to plus 750. One of the five shortest odds in the entire league. Vegas can just not quit the Nets. They can't quit the Nets. Well, neither can we. Zach, I, that's true. <laughs> Nets, we can't quit you. Zach, I, I know you're on the border of possibly quitting the Nets. Can the Nets live up to this pressure of, of possibly of those kinds of odds coming into this season? I'm not I'm not quitting the Nets. The Nets on paper are awesome. I just don't care about the Vegas odds. The Vegas like the Nets were the championship favorites until yep. a ridiculous time last year. Like I don't care about the Vegas odds. I don't care. To me it's insane that their Vegas odds are the same as Milwaukee, who's like a real basketball team that's played together and actually won a championship, but Vegas will do what Vegas does. For me, the Nets are off the board. The Nets are off my board. You can be optimistic about the Nets. You can be pessimistic about the Nets. You can be whatever you want. I want to see them play basketball.